The years between the First and Second World Wars were a period of crisis and instability. Economically, the world had barely recovered from the war before new recessions, deeper than ever, plunged millions into misery and despair. And from that misery grew the monstrous rule of Mussolini's fascists and Hitler's Nazis. Even before the shadow of a Second World War fell across the globe, local wars disfigured the peace. In this edition of Timeline, we ask if there's anything that our age of economic instability and military conflict can learn from the 20 years crisis of the 1920s and 1930s. It was the peoples of Europe who finally put an end to the killing in the trenches of the First World War. In October 1917, the long-suffering peasants and workers of Russia were released from the murderous torment of the war when the Bolshevik Revolution unilaterally declared peace. The following year, the German people overthrew the Kaiser and the war came shuddering to a halt. Two other empires had collapsed under the impact of war. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had dominated Central Europe, disappeared, giving birth to a host of new and independent nations in the heart of the continent. And the Ottoman Turkish Empire was overthrown by the nationalist Young Turk movement. Its disappearance left a power vacuum in the Middle East into which the European powers rushed to carve out their own spheres of influence. One of the earliest bitter fruits of the First World War was harvested here. In 1917, Arthur Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, had declared in favour of a national homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. After the war, Palestine fell under the British mandate and the declaration began to be made fact. We are still living with the consequences of the dispossession of the Palestinian people. But the overarching treaty was negotiated in Paris in 1919. Though its name has been taken from the palace in which it was eventually signed, Versailles. One thousand and thirty-seven delegates from thirty-two countries, supported by massed ranks of advisers and stenographers, gathered in Paris. The sessions were secret, the very words of the delegates muffled by the Catherine de' Medici tapestries that hung on the walls of the conference hall. The American president, Woodrow Wilson, was the most powerful figure at the conference. He headed a nation whose economy had not been devastated by war. On the contrary, it had grown considerably. And that all the US had not entered the war until very late, its contribution had been decisive. Woodrow Wilson, pious and pacifist by inclination, used his authority to push through the creation of the League of Nations, an international body that was supposed to guarantee peace by threatening force against those that broke its injunctions. But the League was flawed from the first. Wilson himself could not get Congress to ratify US participation. Russia refused participation. Italy was soon, under Mussolini, to lose interest in the League. Of the major powers, that left Britain, France and Germany. Germany was marginalised as supposedly the sole guilty party in the First World War. Indeed, this phrase was written into the final Versailles Treaty. France was intent on exacting reparations from Germany on such a scale that she would remain a broken nation for years, if not decades ahead. Britain went along with France. Germany ceded territory to France, Belgium, Denmark and Poland. Eight million Germans found themselves under foreign rule. Germany lost all her colonies to her enemies. Her army and navy were reduced to nominal forces. Germany was required to repay the cost of the war to the victors. She would produce coal for France, Italy and Belgium. She would build ships for the victors. She would pay the cost of her own occupation and, on top of that, she would pay £1,000 million pounds in reparations by 1921. No wonder that Lenin, the leader of revolutionary Russia, justified his country's absence from the League by describing it as a den of thieves. <laughs> 
The breakup of the old empires had created a series of new independent nations. Even a victor like Britain had to let go of most of Ireland and the Irish Free State came into being. Here we see British troops leaving from Dublin. But the southern Irish state was far from being the only new nation. Modern Turkey emerged from the rubble of the Ottoman Empire, headed by Kemal Ataturk, pictured here with his future bride in the year of Turkey's independence, 1923. Austria and Hungary were independent countries created by the fall of the Habsburg Empire. Czechoslovakia was born of the same implosion. Finland was independent, and so were Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, all free as a result of the anti-imperial policies of the Russian Revolution. Poland became an independent state for the first time since 1772. So the peace treaty that was eventually signed, perhaps appropriately, in the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles, would have needed a miracle for it to survive. The peace received a further blow when Mussolini's fascists took power in Italy in 1922. The workers' movement had been on the advance in Italy. In the post-war period, strikes and factory occupations had swept through the country. Inspired by the Russian Revolution, the Communist Party gained a mass membership. Italy's rulers were terrified and they cooperated with Mussolini's fascist bands of demobbed soldiers to break up the labour and socialist movement. The fascist March on Rome was the establishment-aided coup that ended democracy in Italy for more than a generation. Mussolini himself stayed safe in Milan until the coup was over. His march was entirely made in the sleeping car of the train that bore him south. Mussolini's new regime was as aggressive abroad as it was repressive at home. Soon, the imperial ambition of fascism would test the League of Nations to destruction. The story of the interwar years might have been different if the world economy had recovered from the devastation of the First World War. For some, economic prosperity did return. But the world of the so-called Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, the Dance Age, the age of new cocktails, new dances and the new movie industry was an age in which the rich got richer and the poor got left behind. Inflation ripped through some economies, especially the German. The German government printed money to meet the war debts extracted from them by the victors of the First World War. In 1914, one US dollar was worth 4.2 German marks. In 1920, it was worth 40 marks. In 1923, one US dollar was worth 4,200 million marks. Inflation like this meant economic ruin for whole swathes of German society, including its middle classes. Internationally, inflation made nonsense of the reparations being extracted from Germany. But there was no pause for thought. France was determined to extract the full cost of war. In 1923, French and Allied troops occupied the industrial heartland of Germany, the Ruhr. The British left Germany three years later, as we see in this film. But the French remained there until the 1930s. Even before the Wall Street crash, unemployment was high. Even in the so-called boom years of the mid-1920s, unemployment averaged between 10 and 12% in Britain, Germany and Sweden. In Norway and Denmark, the average was 17 to 18%. The hunger marches began in response. In Britain, the first was in 1922. In 1929, marches converged on London from all over the country. The most famous of the marches set out from Jarrow in the northeast of England, bound for London in 1932, only to be broken up by police. In the middle of the Roaring Twenties, in 1926, Britain's workers staged the general strike. The immediate causes of the general strike are not hard to identify. The mines were in private hands and the owners, 
backed by the Conservative government, demanded wage cuts of between 10 and 25%, plus a longer working day, in order to increase their profits. The miners' union fought back under the banner, not a penny off the pay, not a minute on the day. The Trades Union Congress declared that the whole trade union movement would stand behind the miners. The workers' response to the strike call on the 3rd of May was immediate and overwhelming. Some one and three quarter million struck with an enthusiasm which took both the government and the Trade Union Congress by surprise. The strike grew in strength and there were more on strike on the last of its nine days than there were on the first day. But the TUC was terrified by the power of its own members. And when the courts lifted union immunity for damages caused by solidarity strikes, the union leaders collapsed without even getting a promise of no victimizations from the government. It was a dark day that left working people in Britain disarmed in the face of the coming storm of recession. That storm broke in 1929, the year of the Wall Street crash. The world economy collapsed in the wake of the Wall Street crash, as financial speculation turned to full-scale, economy-wide slump, unemployment figures reached new and terrifying heights. Nearly a quarter of Britons were on the dole in the pit of the slump. It was higher in the United States, higher still at 31% in Norway and 32% in Denmark. Germany, already the victim of hyperinflation, now saw unemployment rates of 44%. Even the so-called economic recovery after 1933 saw rates of unemployment of 16 to 17 percent in Britain, 20 percent in the United States and Austria. The political effects were obvious and hideous. Hitler came to power in 1933. His militarized tyranny was the only state in Europe that eliminated unemployment in the 1930s. Fascism was on the march, and the prospect of a Second World War was looming. Vienna, the Austrian capital, had been under a social democratic government. It built houses for workers and presided over a welfare state well in advance of that in most countries. But it was despised by the political right who dominated the national government and who modelled themselves on Mussolini's Italy. In a four-day civil war in 1934, the Chancellor of Austria, Engelbert Dolfus, crushed Red Vienna. but Dolphus had opened Pandora's box. A few months later, Austrian Nazis broke into the Chancellery in Vienna and murdered him. Mussolini himself was now flexing his muscles on the international stage. In the year following the civil war in Austria, he invaded Abyssinia, modern Ethiopia, in the quest to build an African empire. The emperor of Abyssinia, Haile Selassie, appealed to the League of Nations to reverse the Italian invasion. He was jeered by Italian journalists as he made his speech at the League's headquarters in Geneva. His appeal fell on deaf ears. The League was paralysed by the major powers unwillingness to confront Mussolini. The Italian conquest of Abyssinia went on without effective opposition from the League. The failure to stop Mussolini meant that the League was finished as an effective barrier to fascist territorial expansion. First Vienna, now Abyssinia. The world was on the road to war. But there was still one last chance to stop the fascists. Spain. Spain had only become a republic in 1931. Elections that year had given Republicans massive support and triggered a potentially insurrectionary movement. As the country hovered on the brink of civil war, King Alfonso abdicated. But the civil war was not avoided, merely postponed. In 1936, monarchist generals based in the Spanish colony of Morocco invaded mainland Spain. Their leader was Francisco Franco. 
In the civil war that followed, Franco was supported by Mussolini and Hitler. The Italian Air Force and Navy assisted the monarchists. In all, some 50,000 so-called volunteers came from fascist Italy. Hitler sent 10,000 to fight in Spain, including the Luftwaffe's Condor Legion. Spain became the great dividing line in European politics, but the sides were not equal. Russia sent support to the Republican government, but Britain and France stood by while the fascists advanced on the democratic government of Spain. Ordinary people, trade unionists, Labour Party members, socialists and communists, tried to make good the studied absence of their governments. The international brigades were volunteers who went to fight on the side of the Republicans. Altogether, some 40,000 people from 54 countries formed brigades named after their democratic heroes, Lincoln, Garibaldi and Masaryk. Among the volunteers were Joseph Bronz, better known as Yugoslavia's future leader, Marshal Tito. Willy Brandt, post-war German Chancellor, was there as a reporter. Clement Gottwald, later Czechoslovak President. Pietro Nini, leader of the Italian Socialist Party. Hungarian writer, Arthur Kursler, were all there. So was writer George Orwell. So was Jack Jones, future leader of the Transport and General Workers' Union in Britain. So why did they go? Cecil Day-Lewis, England's future poet laureate, tells us why. Tell them in England, if they ask, what brought us to these wars, to this plateau beneath the night's grave manifold of stars. It was not fraud or foolishness, glory, revenge or pain. We came because our open eyes could see no other way. But the international brigades could not turn the tide. The war would ultimately be won or lost by Spanish forces. And here the Republican side had a fateful weakness. As George Orwell documented in his brilliant book, Homage to Catalonia, the Republican government and its Stalinist supporters were too fearful of the revolutionary forces released by the Civil War to fully utilize the capacity of ordinary people to defeat fascism. Eventually, in battle after battle, the Republican government was smothered by Franco and his fascist allies. Now the die was cast. As the war in Spain drew to a close, Hitler began his triumphal march of conquest through Europe. In 1937, the Nazis annexed Austria, then Czechoslovakia, then Poland, then came the invasion of France. Only World War could stop the Nazis now. This has been Timeline, the consequences of the First World War. The years between the First and Second World Wars were a period of crisis and instability. Economically, the world had barely recovered from the war before new recessions, deeper than ever, plunged millions into misery and despair. And from that misery grew the monstrous rule of Mussolini's fascists and Hitler's Nazis. Even before the shadow of a Second World War fell across the globe, local wars disfigured the peace. In in October 1917, the long-suffering peasants and workers of Russia were released from the murderous torment of the war when the Bolshevik Revolution unilaterally declared peace. The following year, the German people overthrew the Kaiser and the war came shuddering to a halt. Two other empires had collapsed under the impact of war. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had dominated Central Europe, disappeared, giving birth to a host of new and independent nations in the heart of the continent and the Ottoman Turkish Empire was overthrown by the nationalist Young Turk movement. Its disappearance left a power vacuum in the Middle East into which the European powers rushed to carve out their own spheres of influence. One of the earliest bitter fruits of the First World War was harvested here. In 1917, Arthur Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, had declared in favour of a national homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. After the war, Palestine fell under the British mandate 
and the declaration began to be made fact. We are still living with the consequences of the dispossession of the Palestinian people. But the overarching treaty was negotiated in Paris in 1919, though its name has been taken from the palace in which it was eventually signed, Versailles. One thousand and thirty-seven delegates from thirty-two countries, supported by massed ranks of advisers and stenographers, gathered in Paris. The sessions were secret. In this edition of Timeline, we ask if there's anything that our age of economic instability and military conflict can learn from the twenty years crisis of the 1920s and 1930s. It was the peoples of Europe who finally put an end to the killing in the trenches of the First World War.